Imagine for a moment, three players are playing a bizarro version of Scrabble. The goal of the game is simple. Each player has a single secret letter, and they have to agree on the highest letter in a given round. It sounds kind of easy, and for the most part, it is easy, until Rick over here picks a blank tile. And what he does next will both break the game and prove that it's impossible for three computers to agree on a letter with 100% certainty. This is a proof of impossibility that exists in any network connecting more than two devices today, and it's one we've known about since at least 1989. Today's paper is 100 Impossibility Proofs for Distributed Computing. It was written by Nancy Lynch. The paper is more than 35 years old. Yes, it does go through 100 proofs, and today we're going to focus on one of them as a means of both getting a feel for what an impossibility proof is and understanding how it's useful. I'm also delighted to inform you that it is not just my flapping mouth you're going to hear from on this one. I managed to sit down with my good friend and master of distributed systems witchcraft, Brooklyn Zelenka. She's the one that put me onto this idea of impossibility proofs in the first place, and I thought it'd be best if you heard from her. Like, Brooke, what is an impossibility proof? Yeah, an impossibility proof is a way of reasoning about a problem to say, here are the sort of like the bounds of what is even possible. Instead of setting a particular algorithm, let's assume magically that there's an algorithm that, that has certain properties. What would that mean? Um, and then we find that, oh, that's actually, that seems incompatible with reality because it has logical contradictions in it. So how is an impossibility proof useful in research? These are very, very important. Um, they let you, in, in, in short, know where to put your time. If something's not possible, logically impossible, right? Analytically impossible, um, you shouldn't waste your time on it. And you now know the bounds of what you're working with. Even if you have two computers next to each other, there's some degree of latency, right? And uh, the confusing thing is we like to think of things from a bird's eye view where we can see the entire system running in a single picture. But each of those nodes only sees messages that it's receiving off the wire. It doesn't know that the other nodes are up or down. They could be offline. There could be a network partition. It could be faulty. You know, all of these problems that it doesn't know about. The only thing it gets is notes slipped under the door, basically. Right. I don't know what Brooke's talking about. I can't see how a bird's eye view would be helpful for understanding the way an algorithm works. Anyway, let's relate this to Bizarro Scrabble. In our game, the processes are players, and local knowledge is the stuff they know firsthand. The tile in front of them and the thoughts in their heads. Just like in real life, local knowledge is the only thing that the players can be 100% sure of. Unlike real life, computer networks are built on point-to-point -point communication. This is why our players can't talk. Instead, they can only pass messages using tiles. Oh, and one more thing. Stuff can go wrong. We call stuff going wrong faults. Faults come in all sorts of flavors. Computer unplugged, bad software update, configured the wrong bleep bloop in config.json. Engineers will know this stuff will happen and plan for it by designing algorithms that are fault tolerant. In distributed systems, we express fault tolerance as a ratio of redundancy, like 2t plus 1, which means you need two times the number of faults you want to handle, plus one more. So with three players in our game, we're able to handle at most one fault, and things will still work. If we want to be able to handle two faults, we would need 2t times 2 plus 1, which would be five nodes. Faults usually don't happen, but the problem is they can happen. We don't know how they're going to happen, and we can't predict when they will happen. All right, let's do a run of our game working normally so that we have a full set of rules and a baseline. First off, only a majority of players have to agree on the highest letter in our single round. So if the letters A, B, and D were passed between the three players, the round is successful if at least two players answer A. If E, F, and H were spread between the three, the winning answer would be two E's. If one player submits a different letter or doesn't show up in time, the other two players form the majority. If two things go wrong, well, that's one fall too many and we have to accept that this round is broken. Each player follows a simple routine. Get a letter from another player, compare it to the one they have, keep the higher letter. After waiting for 20 seconds, all players lock in their answers, and the round is over. This will work with games of two players, three players, or 5,000. The more players you have, the more faults you can tolerate. Now, it's time to prove that it's impossible for this game to work 100% of the time by constructing a scenario that uses a single fault. And that's going to put the game in a state that doesn't make any sense. Remember from the wildly suspenseful introduction, Rick has gotten the blank tile, while his compatriots Qwerty and Peaches over here have both drawn the letter D. 
We're supposed to be able to handle a single fault, so the right answer in this round should still be D, despite the blank tile. Sad mode Rick needs to send a message, but they have nothing to go on because his local knowledge is corrupted. So Rick just picks the letter A at random and sends it over to Peaches. Next, QWERTY sends Rick a message, and he gets the letter D. Because Rick is going from knowing nothing to at least something, he assumes that what he's received is true and runs with that. QWERTY also sends the letter D to Peaches, but because Rick sent A earlier, Peaches considers these two and throws away the D because A is higher. Now we're in a situation where QWERTY and Rick correctly answer D, while silly looking Peaches incorrectly thinks the answer is A. This is no bueno. When the players reveal their tiles, they're not just wrong, they're in a logical impossibility. In one interpretation of this, the highest letter rule shows that QWERTY and Rick are wrong. There's an A tile, and they should have switched. But they didn't, so they're faulty. On the other hand, the majority rules rule applies as well, which means that Peaches is the faulty player, and they should be kicked out. When Rick sent the A tile message to Peaches, poor Peaches has no way of distinguishing that this particular A tile is a faulty message. It's just a note slipped under the door like any other. This is the single fault scenario that shows the game in a configuration that should not be possible. Now, obviously this isn't too big of a deal for our friends playing a made up tile game, but if each of these players were replicas in a database agreeing on your bank account balance, all of a sudden we care a lot about being certain. You might zero in on the pick a letter at random part as being something downright silly that a computer would absolutely never do. I'm here to tell you, strange stuff like this happens all the time on networks. Stuff gets unplugged, things crash, different versions of the same program run at the same time, computers join and leave at random, and the longer a network is running, the more probable strange stuff like this will happen. You literally do not know that the other computer wasn't doused in silly string the moment after they sent you a perfectly healthy message. The best you can do is to say some percentage of the time, some high percentage of the time, uh, I'm going to be uh, in sync. And if too many nodes go down, I'm screwed and I have to just stop. Why isn't this so bad? Like, what, how do we, how do we, you know, why, why do we actually not really need 100% certainty to be functional? Well, we actually get pre pretty good un understanding of like, okay, under these assumptions, I'll have a pretty good idea of what the other machines are doing, right? I assume that they only send messages once every however often, you know, once every five minutes. And I can measure how many messages came in and I can check on faulty processes and all this stuff from an engineering point of view, right? Which is all about trade-offs and all about what's the level of acceptable reliability because there's no such thing as 100%. I only need this to run 99.9999% of the time and that's okay. And I can live with a 0. 0.00001 downtime. Uh, then we can understand roughly like, okay, what, what's acceptable? So going back to our game, there are a few ways that we could fix this. First, unintuitively, maybe, we were, could require a fourth player. Going to 3T plus one means we now every player will communicate with this fourth player, and this added set of communications will propagate to each other player. But that will only solve one part of our problem. If we add a fourth player, the majority will coalesce around the letter A, which is the letter that Hot Hands Rick over here invented out of thin air. If we require 3T plus 1, the game won't end in a split brain state, but this will not affect the fact that A was fabricated in the first place. That's called a Byzantine fault. There are two buckets of solutions for dealing with Byzantine faults. The first is ignore the problem. The second is to change the algorithm. Ignoring the problem is less flippant than it sounds, and is often what a project will and should do. It's honestly totally fine to say, well, if nodes send valid fake messages, stuff isn't going to work. And it's less big of a deal because a lot of the time this is happening inside of data centers all controlled by the same people. It also means that software bugs that produce valid but wrong messages run the risk of taking that whole thing down. Neat! An alternative is to take the problem on head on and change the rules of our game to give us a means of separating faulty messages from factual ones. This is a lot easier said than done and the subject of another video. You can still have consensus. You just have to understand what its limitations are. We've made tremendous progress because we know how to, you know, from this huge field, we know how to limit down um, what, uh, what, part, what kinds of solutions are acceptable. This is what makes distributed systems both so fascinating and so impressive. 
Most of distributed systems research is classifying, isolating, and figuring out ways to deal with stuff getting weird. And not to get too philosophical about it, but there's more than a little bit of human nature reflected in this kind of work. The last line of the paper says, the limitation of local knowledge is the fundamental fact about the setting in which we work. And it is a very powerful limitation. Maybe, just maybe, that limitation applies to more than just networks of computers. We can never be 100% sure that we fully understand what's happening in someone else's head. The best thing we can do is learn how to pass useful messages under the door and nurture configurations that work well enough for long enough to be productive. Learning to be cool with 99.59% sure when working in a group setting might be a nice life lesson. Maybe. Up to you. Anyways, until next time, hope to see you somewhere on the internet. And don't forget to touch some grass.